Almighty and most merciful God, of whose gift alone it cometh that thy faithful people do unto thee true and laudable service, grant that we, faithfully serving thee in this life, may finally come to those everlasting joys through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we are now with Dr. Dermot McCulloch's Thomas Cranmer, and we come to Chapter 5, pages 136 to about 172, for 800-page, no, I'm sorry, about 650 pages or so. The last full year of Queen Anne's reign saw a further evangelical advance in England. Even the formation of an evangelical establishment within the central institutions of the church and state. That's a pretty big statement. Not unchallenged or all-powerful, but for the moment, keeping the initiative against the traditional supporters of the king's supremacy. Its membership is quite precisely indicated by the correspondence and verse dedications of Nicholas Bourbon, fashionable French evangelical poet who carved a niche for himself at Anne's court. Bourbon had been brought from imprisonment in France through the Queen's intercession on the initiative of the evangelical royal theologian William Butts. He lodged with Butts while he was in England. Cromwell and Butts, of course, figure prominently in his poems together with the royal family and various young courtiers, while the clerics are Cranmer and his circle of evangelical friends. It's a very fascinating comment and a side note that uh, is entirely brand new. There's a French evangelical uh, milling about like a gadfly and it, make, it makes reports. Abbott Benson of Westminster, Hugh Latimer, Thomas Goodrich, and Thomas Thurlby. These are some of the inner circle. From Bourbon's collected works called New Guy, we've already quoted one hymn of praise to Cromwell, Cranmer, and Henry VIII as the epigraph to part two. Among several other flattering references and dedications to Cranmer is one charming little poem in the spring of 1535, inviting the archbishop out for a rural holiday, probably at Benson's country retreat, which Bourbon assured the archbishop would seem like the spring gardens of Adonis or Adonis. Noticeable among Bourbon's continental dedicates is Cranmer's old acquaintance, Simon Grenaeus. And there's a footnote here to David Starkey's Henry VIII, a European court. Now, this is a fascinating opening to the period 1535 to 37, just how far inroads quasi-Lutheran or evangelical reformers went. Cranmer himself now lost powers, precedence, and in the end even some of his lands to the new institution of the vicegerency. His officials may have resented the process, but there's no sign that power was ever very important to him. What mattered was the furtherance of the gospel as he conveyed it, and he may have been relieved to be rescued from the wounding fiasco of his visitation. Now, this is spring, 1535. He's been in the archbishopric for two years. It's been five years since he went to the continent and to Rome, and what, four, three and a half to four years when he made his continental trip again, picks up a wife, gets acquainted with uh, the Lutheran state of things on the continent. He's made archbishop. 
And what does Thomas Cranmer know, and when does he know it in 1535? We are trying to track his theological developments, which is edgy and confused, confusing to do. We get the fuller glimpse, of course, 1547 to 1553, and at his death in 1556, where he holds out his defiant and sinful hand to be burned. Picking back up here, the place of the visitation came a determined court campaign to assert the royal supremacy and promote the evangelical advance in the church. The consecration, 11 April 1535, of Queen Anne's almoner, Nicholas Shaxton, to be Campeggio's successor at Salisbury was the first step. And while evangelicals rose, traditionalists fell. I've got a footnote here uh, noting that McCulloch uses the term as he advised in the early chapter, evangelicals. Nationally respected opponents of the supremacy were given repeated demonstrations throughout the spring and summer that they would be treated ruthlessly. 1535 becomes notable for the deaths of Thomas More and Bishop John Fisher. Between May and July, leading Carthusians, a monk of Sion Abbey, and then most shockingly of all, Bishop Fisher and Thomas More were executed. Cranmer himself was present at More's last interrogations in the tower on June three but in Moore's description of the occasion it is significant that he does not record anything of Cranmer's contribution the archbishop characteristically let Chancellor Audley and Cromwell do the talking or perhaps we would want to challenge that observation in that sense and say that they did not let Cranmer do the questioning that this was more of a legal and a state and a political affair and Cranmer knowing his place kept his the vest the cards close to the vest so it wasn't a matter of Cranmer letting oddly and more uh, Cromwell do the talking as if he's granting permission that's a little bit much there Dr. McCulloch very much later Cranmer affirmed that he opposed Moore's execution. There's no good reason to disbelieve him. We've seen already that he had done his best to suggest a compromise for Moore when he was arrested in 1534. There's equally no good reason to suppose that now any more than 1534, his opinion would have carried much weight against Henry's vicious hatred of his former chancellor. So that's how 1535 should be remembered in terms of Grand Marion. The king's vigorous pushing for the royal supremacy needs hardly, hardly needs explanation, but rather less predictable when his decision to pursue renewed contacts with Lutheran princes of Germany and Scandinavia, culminating in an embassy to the Germans, headed by the newly consecrated Bishop Edward Fox during this autumn of 1535. So by autumn, Moore and Fisher are dead. Yeah, what's the game here on Henry's part with Germany and Scandinavia? He's got his eyes on Spain France, Italy, Charles V. Hardly can be theology. Henry, faced with the emperor's hostility, seeing his former ally, the French King Francis I, an increasingly trust, untrustworthy servant, untrustworthy man, for the moment saw the princes, Lutheran princes as the only feasible alternative 
to friends on the continent, his estrangement from Francis I was completed by the monarch's horror at the deaths of Fisher and Moore. Well, let's reverse this a little bit and talk about it. What did Charles V think of the death of Moore and the godly Fisher or the Italians or the French? Well, we're told here the French monarch was horrified. What did the Germans think? Henry even proposed joining the Prince's Schmalkaldic League. As part of his new strategy, he became obsessed with speaking to Philip Melanchthon in person in England. And he will try and try and try and try to do that. Melanchthon will never come. That will be an irritant to Henry. And also diverting him from the talks with the King of France, Melanchthon had only reluctantly agreed to these and in the end failed to meet King Francis as well. Melanchthon was the only continental reformer for whom Henry VIII showed any genuine enthusiasm. Perhaps he was attracted by the reformer's reputation as a humanist scholar who sought the middle way, characteristics that were part of Henry's own self-image. This was not Melanchthon's first official invitation to England, and it would not be the last. Grandma, what does he know about these invitations? We must surely assume that he was aware of Henry's attitudes. And may, what did Cranmer have by way of writings by Melanchthon? We know he had the Augsburg Confession. That was a notorious document of 1530. He probably saw that in 1532, maybe earlier. And it would not be the last, but he never, this is Melanchthon though, he never risked the English Channel. And the baffling political, theological world that lay beyond the Channel. Nevertheless, in August 1535, he fulsomely dedicated the latest edition of his doctoral work, Locus Communis, to Henry. Interesting. We have that over on the shelf over here. I read that 20 years ago. I wasn't that impressed with it. And then we have the 1521 edition, I think. Uh, we need to revisit it, reread it, and see what really what was going on in Melanchthon's mind on both periods, but he dedicates it to Henry. And if Henry had it, typically he would hand something over to uh, uh, Cranmer to give his review, pros and cons. So Cranmer, we're going to make an inference here, was on top, was aware of and abreast on this 1535 Lacai Communis, Communis. He sent it across to England in the care of a wandering Scottish Lutheran, Alexander Elaine, who had romantically transformed his name into Elysius the Wanderer. We'll hear more about this. And who remained in England for some years, benefiting from Cranmel, Cromwell's and Cranmer's patronage. We shall repeatedly make Elysius's acquaintance. The Archbishop had a keen interest in what Melanchthon had to say in the Lockeye Communis. Wish he had some supporting documentation from that. During the summer of 1535, the strength of the evangelicals revealed in this diplomacy was given its most dramatic expression when Henry and Anne themselves became the leading actors in a touring pageant of the new dispensation, as Cranmer had done the previous summer. They headed into the West Country in one of the longest and most significant progresses of Henry's reign. As the royal retinue moved slowly in a great circle from Windsor to Tewkesbury, 
down through the Vale of Gloucester and into Wiltshire and Hampshire. West country evangelicals were especially rewarded by royal visits, which was a sign of divine favor, uh, royal favor. Maybe Cranmer had done some research for the route on his journey west. Or presumably he went too. The extraordinary nature of the event was also emphasized by the presence of Thomas Cromwell near the king for most of the itinerary, with the new vicegerent taking the opportunity to visit various monasteries in person. The impact of his progress in the king's ostentatious public backing of those promoting religious change was probably a major factor in keeping the West quiet during the pilgrimage of grace in the following year. From their beginning in June, these royal journeys were marked by a barrage of propaganda about the royal supremacy with orders going out to all bishops to lead preaching campaigns. The newly consecrated Jackson congratulated Cromwell on prompting the king to take this action. Cranmer himself carried the message into remoter parts of the diocese and into the still unsympathetic atmosphere of his own cathedral. Using the new powers of the faculty office during the summer, he also issued more na nationwide preaching licenses to his most trusted evangelical preachers, two of them. Dr. John Thickstow of Pembroke College, Cambridge, and John Cheek of St. John's, Cambridge, was not even a deacon in, in orders at the time. This seems to have been the first evidence of a new group of four officially recognized preachers who were licensed to preach, naturally in the evangelical interest, throughout the realm. <clears throat> Three years later, a foreign observer noted among them the prime exponent of Lutheranism in England, Dr. Robert Barnes, as noted by in footnote eight. The theater of the royal progress culminated in Michael Mustide, late September, in a great assembly of bishops and notables at Winchester, an appropriate place as Bishop Gardner's cathedral city to symbolize the united backing of evangelicals and conservatives for the supreme headship. It was noticeable that the hosts of the royal party in Hampshire were more conservative than on the earlier stages of the progress. The visit was therefore a sign that the king was forgiving Gardner for his earlier recalcitrance and was rewarding him for the two writings which he was now completing. The bishop's major work was De Vera Obedientia, generally acknowledged when it was published to be one of the most effective defenses of the royal supremacy. He had also produced on a small and smaller scale a sneering answer to the Pope's furious condemnations at the executions of Fisher and Moore. Cranmer came over from Kent to Winchester partly to consult with Gardner on the final version of the text of the latter tract. That is amazing. That Gardner could hardly claim to an unqualified victory out of these events. Cranmer had his own leading role in the Winchester pageant because the evangelical stock on the bishop's bench was now to receive a spectacular boost. And while he was there, the Archbishop consecrated John Hilsey to, fi to fill Fisher's vacant see in Rochester. Edward Herford, or Edward Fox for Herford, and Ganucci's successor at Worcester, no less than a figure, 
than Hugh Latimer. Latimer's appointment was particularly outrageous, considering that only two years before the diocesan establishment of Worcester had been trying to nail Latimer as a heretic. Hilsey was nearly as symbolic a figure as Latimer, for he'd been a sudden but sincere convert from traditionalism to evangelicalism during Latimer's troubles of 1533 at Bristol. Later in this, on 20, year 20, December 1535, the vice-gerent granted Hilsey a commission to license all preachers in the city of London, an extraordinary insult to Gardner's like-minded colleague, the Bishop of London, John Stokesley. we got some footnotes here, um, some of which I won't comment on, continuing to watch how Dermot McCulloch uses, reuses, over and over the word evangelicals, who only that summer had complained about Hilsey's preaching in London. Moreover, the price of Gardner's rehabilitation in these celebrations was what amounted to honorable exile. Despite all his propaganda for the king's cause, within a few days of the royal party leaving Winchester, he set out for a prolonged embassy to the French king, and he was thus removed from an active role in English politics for full three years. During that time, the evangelicals continued to ride high, triumphantly surviving the potential lethal crises, crises of the fall of Anne Boleyn and the pilgrimage of grace. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.